You are listening to the Tri-Quarter Transmissions. Weekly Trek, Episode 18, fourth week of August, 2018. Welcome to Weekly Trek. Weekly Trek is a Tricorder Transmissions podcast network weekly show covering the news and current events in the Star Trek universe with rotating hosts from the Tricorder Transmissions network and sometimes special guests too. Each week, our hosts hand select Trek news from around the internet and present them to you with our analysis. Think of it like the six o'clock news, but for Star Trek. And I am one of your humble hosts today. I'm John, host of the Trek Profiles podcast. And with me is the amazing, amazeballs and totally awesome Shashank Avaru. Hey, Shashank, how you doing? I'm very well. Namaste, homo sapiens. It's wonderful to talk to everyone today. I feel very, uh, quote unquote, blessed because it seems like a very auspicious day to record. We're recording this on the 19th of August, which is the combined birthdays of Jonathan Frakes and Gene Roddenberry. Is that right? I did not know that. That is amazing yeah. that it just worked out that we would be recording on this auspicious day. And I believe it's also, I, the name escapes me, but it's also the birthday of the actress who played uh, Dr. Pulaski. So there you go. There are, there are three. Oh, uh, uh, Diana Muldaur. Yep. Uh, there is actually a photo going around this morning on social medias where on the set of The Next Generation, Jonathan Frakes and Gene Roddenberry cut a cake together early on. Is this very interesting? I might send it to you afterward. But yeah, it's great to be here, John. It's wonderful to be talking to you today. Thank you for joining me on Weekly Trek. Oh, it's my pleasure. I don't think we've actually done a Weekly Trek together, have we? Right. No, this is, I like how I'm running the roulette on every week's Weekly Trek. And I... I've managed to find each uh, host. I'm still coming for uh, the rest that I haven't gotten to talk to. So I'm coming for you guys. I'm gunning for you. But I'm glad uh, now I get to add John to my uh, to my belt. All right. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited too. So shall we jump into the stories then? Absolutely. It's uh, it, I'm, I'm glad to be reporting uh, a story about one of my favorite brown people in the world, Shahzad Latif. During uh, this is from Trek movie, and uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the format, dear listener. But at STLV, they usually close off one of the prop sets every year, where and the actors and creators of the shows come out and they talk to they talk to the media's and they do interviews that are released later on after STLV is finished. And we have a few of these interviews to cover today. The first one is from Shahzad Latif. And it's on trekmovie.com, as I said earlier. And he talks about his emotional return as Tyler, his emotional return as Vogue. And he's excited to work with some of the actors, just a lot of excitement. And he acknowledges that the first season was a bit darker than most season ones, but that's why season two is going to be a big change. One thing he doesn't seem to like, though, is the makeup. That's the feeling I get, uh, the makeup of Vogue. Did you get that too? John, what did you think? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I just got to give uh, incredible credit to any of the actors that sit for hours in the makeup trailer and just get that stuff put on. I mean, it has to be an absolutely exhausting ordeal. And I don't think I could do it. But I thought it was funny that in the article, he makes reference to the fact that, well, if they need me to get back into Vogue for some reason, for some story reason, uh, wouldn't it be great if they could do it all digitally and just put me in a motion capture suit for a little bit? <laughs> um, it's uh, it's interesting that you say you don't like makeup and you do one of the most elaborate costumes at STLV. Uh, for those unfamiliar, John often does. Uh, is it Loki, Loki? Uh, uh, supporter. Uh, we are the followers of Lokai, correct? But followers of Lokai, and uh, it's it's a fascinating costume. If anybody's interested, they should check out Trek profiles and John's Twitter. He has pictures on it. Another thing that I really like is that he mentions Tilly and how uh, the actress is it Mary Wise, Mary Wiseman. Yes, uh, they're uh, they're really close in real life, and he's excited to get hopefully get back to doing more scenes with Tilly, which kind of makes me happy. It's nice that there is a real world camaraderie 
between the actors that they're trying to bleed on to the actual show. It always works best when there is real world chemistry and then you put it on screen. Uh, I, I've always found that to be joyful. What do you think? Well, I want to address that in a second. I just want to go back and, and uh, issue a correction. My costume that I do is not elaborate because I don't do anything with prosthetics. There are, <laughs> there are people who come in with very extensive amounts of prosthetics, and I don't do any of that. Uh, I just have makeup applied to my skin. So uh, it's a completely separate thing when, you know, the only part of your body that's exposed to the normal air is like your lips or, or your eyeballs or something. I give big credit to people who can manage that, but uh, makeup is not a big deal. Okay. But as for as for uh, Shazad and, and uh, Mary working together, I thought they were delightful. And it's interesting when you look at a show and, you know, there are shows that I've watched in the past, and I'm not even thinking of Star Trek here, where I've watched a show for five years and then someone will say, well, you know, these two characters never had a scene together, these two major characters. And I think, oh, my gosh, you're right. You know, how, how incredible is that? In fact, you know, here's a little bit of mind blowing trivia for you. Uh, a very famous movie in sci-fi circles, The Fifth Element, right? The hero and the antagonist share exactly zero screen time together. They, they are not on the screen at any time together in the whole film. And it's weird when you think about that, right? And so uh, it's clear as we left season one that that uh, I'm going to use Shazad's term, Vokler, is going one direction and Tilly's going another direction. And just based on how the story's going, it seems like these paths are probably not going to cross together again uh, without some major gymnastics. Um, it seems like uh, that's what he's trying to tell us. And that's sad because uh, I, I enjoyed seeing them together. I thought they had some nice chemistry and uh, I think it's nice for the actors. You know, they want to do scenes together and they don't get the chance to do it. Speaking of uh, Vokler and season, season two and the lighter tone, another person whose interview specifically focuses a lot on the lighter tone is Anthony Rapp's interview. Same uh reporting Trek movie did an interview with him and he starts off firstly addressing that the first season was was dark and how a lot of his journey will be coming out from that darkness now we know from Wilson Cruz who has reported more than once on his Twitter and through any channel he can find that he will be coming back so it's he also talks a little bit about his love story but first I want to get your thoughts on his dark tone in the first season in general, the enemy is here, like that, those eyes being taken out. And he was, he was one of the darkest characters, wouldn't you agree, in season one? So let me just preface this uh, by saying that I've been doing a very public rewatch of Star Trek in, uh, in my show account on Twitter at Trek Profiles. And I'm a disciplined rewatcher. In other words, like I don't uh, pick and choose episodes. I, I watch whole series straight through, right? I watch every episode in order and that's just how I, how I choose to do it. And so I've been tweeting out some of the episodes and some of my thoughts on things and, you know, people are free to engage with me on that if they want to. But as I started Deep Space Nine, uh, people were telling me, oh, it's the darkest. Uh, and I said, no, no. It's basically a light comedy compared to a lot of the things that are happening uh, in Discovery, I think, just yeah. in tone. And I, I don't think that that moniker that people have attached to Deep Space Nine can hold in 2018 with what we've got coming out today. So having said that, I am delighted to see that they're going to have a different tone in season two. And I think that Anthony Rabbi puts a lot of the burden for that dark season one on the fact that we had this mirror universe captain. And so that sort of influenced the storytelling in a lot of ways. But I do think that I think it's a return to Trekdom, I think, to have a little bit of a balance between lighter moments, more serious moments, philosophical moments, thoughtful moments, action moments. And I think that's what made the original Trek so powerful, TOS. And um, I think it's exciting to see that in Discovery. It's one of the things I missed in season one, uh, to be perfectly honest. So I'm very excited and very optimistic about it. How about you? And and what better way to bring back the Trekdom than, but, than through the Enterprise? Like they literally bring in track them through the the and the vehicle the the torchbearer of what is star trek and he also talks a little bit in this interview about how captain pike is one of those people that is bringing back the lighter tone which to me is kind of surprising because anson mount's character captain pike of course comes from like hunter's original take in the original series and he's going to that is where they'll eventually land us is where we saw Hunter in the cage and 
that was one of the darkest trek episodes it still is to me it's an episode about a man being imprisoned and questioning everything that is real and being treated like a like a pet inside a, a cage to be to be watched and admired and it's interesting that he says that captain pike and his crew are the people that bring the positive tone because when i saw that pilot the first time i thought this is really dark and in a weird way kirk and their crew were a lot lighter to me so it's it'll be an interesting arc for me to see how these people will bring in the positive tone and how they'll end up in that very dark place in the cage where pike is questioning everything I'd agree with you. And I just want to say that I thought that Jeffrey Hunter's portrayal of Pike was probably one of the most interesting and I think in a lot of ways realistic portrayals of a of a of a military leader that I think I've seen in Star Trek. Because you see the weight of it on him. And, you know, when he's having that conversation with Boyce, which is, you know, it's like one of the first scenes in the very mm-hmm. first bit of Star Trek that was ever filmed. It really did have a reality to it and a truth to it that I think we abstracted a little bit in in a lot of other incarnations of Trek. You know, just the, the burdens of command, which is something that, you know, I, I saw people struggle with uh, in my life. And so I, I think that I'm excited to see how they bring it back. Uh, and I'm excited to see the character's journey. But I am conflicted, Shashank, because one of the things that is always on my mind as just an amateur that has a very amateur interest in in all things space is that space is supposed to be big, right? Space is supposed to be vast and ginormous, and it is, and yet we keep running into the same people and we keep running into the same family and the same cast of characters, you know, and it's... it's uh, I'm always very aware of that when I see us coming back to revisit old stories in Star Trek. And I don't mean old stories that like thematically, but I'm talking about, oh, this space virus that we encountered once, now we're going to encounter it again, you know, or these same characters that we encountered once, we're going to encounter them again, right? There's supposed to be billions of people in the Federation, but we keep running across the same group. And I, I get that there's story reasons to do that, but it's something that is just always on my mind when I see these things happen. That's an interesting point. I have always likened space and its vastness in shows, especially like Star Trek, to the world, like our planet. The Earth is huge, right? I have lived on three continents, and yet every weekend I end up talking for two hours with my parents. Or once every couple of months, I'll call my favorite uncle. It's it's how I think of these characters too, is yes, space is vast and everything is unknown and there's a lot more to be explored, but there is some comfort for not just the crew, but for us, the viewer, when we go back to that to that family feeling at Thanksgiving, when everybody comes together, there is a lot of tension there, but there's also a lot of love there. In a world full of unknown variables, it's nice that occasionally you run into or you end up with someone who is in... A, who was a part of your life at some point, and now it's exciting to see how they have changed and how you have changed. There is something comforting and constant about that feeling. So I think that's why that is the biggest story reason I, I would see why they do it. And yes, you're right, there are story reasons, but that's how I look at it. Like it's it's great that there are unknowns. It's it's also nice every now and then just to just to get that feeling because these shows are supposed to mirror our lives in a weird way. And even though throughout the year, we do all kinds of crazy things. Right around Thanksgiving and Christmas, somehow it does not feel like Christmas or Thanksgiving without our family and our near and dear. People who we, yes, probably only see once a year, but without them, it just feels like there is something missing. So it's like a, it's just like a little bit of uh, coming home to me and then then I'm off to do my new adventure. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I, I get you. I'm okay with it too. I, you know, But it's just something that, I, I think about, and I always challenge myself, like, now, why did it have to be the Enterprise and Captain Pike? Couldn't it have been the USS Republic or the USS Exeter or one of the other Constitution class vessels with some other captain, right? Because the, the other part of it, and this is, you know, might be a whole can of worms here, but when you bring in an existing character, then you have to worry about, okay, now I have to connect this character to the future character and worry about you know, the emotional journey and worry about the uh, quote unquote canonical uh, connections. Whereas if it was a different character, you'd have more freedom to do things differently. So we know, for instance, that Pike cannot die. 
because he's in future episodes that we've seen. So we know that that character will never be in jeopardy uh, in, 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 and, and have actually, you know, uh, death, right? We know that that cannot happen. Uh, whereas if you had another character, you could have that happen. So uh, it puts some constraints on the story. But, you know, I'm not trying to second guess the writers. I'm just pointing this out uh, as something that, that I think we have to think about as viewers of the show, right? So right. I'm, I'm excited to uh, see where they go with it. Yeah, it's those are those are two really good points. Uh, I think the first one about why it might be the USS Enterprise. Well, I think if you pull out right from the actual season one and look at the big picture, well, uh, Burnham is related to Spock, and Spock is on the Enterprise. So, like, there is a there is. I'm sure we'll find out why it was the Enterprise, but we do see in the in the trailer that a that. Pike has come to take command of the ship and be that Spock is in trouble and there is something going on that Burnham needs to help him with. So there is a there is a comfort, like there is a little story arc there that rounds things up. Hopefully they'll do a lot more than just that little round because then you're right, it would be boring. But to the second point of, uh, you know, that this character might not die and that's why there might be something a little bit that, that might, you're right, the jeopardy of it is gone. But isn't that true of every Star Trek show? From the pilot on, we know that the captain will never die. Like, we know Kirk cannot die. We know Picard cannot die. There is no way they're going to kill Cisco. They just, we know those things. So, and, uh, they killed, and yet we enjoy they it They killed anyway. Michelle Yeoh. That is true. And that was the first time they actually did it in a show that, ironically, we're actually talking about these things about. So... It's it's definitely, I think there is uh, there is that that jeopardy element is also like what else is being done in Star Trek is I think more than makes up for some of those smaller, like hey this character cannot be in jeopardy things. But you're right, I do agree with your points. I just feel like there is a counter argument there. Gotcha. Well, I think it's great, and we'll see what happens, and uh, we'll go from yeah. there. So I think it's exciting. I'm glad we talked about Anthony Rapp and his interview, but I also wanted to get your opinion because he slightly hints at the short tracks that are coming out. You're familiar with these, right? Yeah, these little uh, these little amuse bouches that we're going to be getting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and he he does not want to tell us if he's uh, in them or not, which is great. But I wanted to see what your four short tracks would be. I know one is going to be centered around Saru. I, I would love to know what the other three that you think are going to be out. Yeah, you know, um, I, I got to tell you, I'm really glad they're doing this. And I'm really glad they're doing it in this way because it turns out that there are things that they can probably do in the short form sort of short takes, I guess, that just probably wouldn't fit in with the episodic show. And it's going to give them an, an opportunity to give us a little bit more depth on some things. So I think it's great. And I'm glad that they're releasing it in the same way. I'm particularly thinking about a bad experience that I had. I don't know if you were uh, watching the uh, reimagined Battlestar Galactica when that was on the air. I am one of the biggest fans of Battlestar Galactica, the reimagined series. Okay, yeah. so I, I was too. And and one of the things that they did when that show was on the air was they did these webisodes. Uh, so mm -hmm. sometimes we would have to wait a year in between the the different seasons. And right. they did these webisodes, which were very high quality. They were really mm -hmm. well done. They were told in like these minute and a half to three minute segments. And... Mm -hmm. There was a couple of them which were absolutely pivotal in understanding why characters took certain actions later on. Mm -hmm. But because they were done as a web series, there were contractual things with writers and different legal things that came into effect, which made them unavailable like when they did the DVD series. So if you bought the DVDs, you didn't get some of the webisodes. And the webisodes are actually important to understanding the reason why certain other things happened in the show. So it's uh, I'm, I'm glad that I think Discovery is approaching it in this way and uh, producing them as part of all access. And this way, you know, when we get the DVDs or the Blu-rays out, uh, everything will be together and people will be able to enjoy it. And uh, they won't be lost to, in the mists of history like some of the Battlestar Galactica stuff was. And great pull on that Battlestar Galactica, by the way. I'm a, like I said, I'm a huge fan. And every time somebody talks about Battlestar Galactica, my fracking heart just just bursts. Uh, so I, I and for those I've heard I've read about this on the media's. Some people are having a 
oh yeah, this is a money grab and they're trying to make money off of uh, people b- because they won't otherwise subscribe to January 29. You know what? I am happy to pay that money for the short tracks. I really am. I personally have loved everything that Discovery has done. And if, if I get 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes of Star Trek Discovery before my actual season starts for six bucks, I'm more than happy to pay that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have to acknowledge that there's some people out there that $6 a month is a serious financial commitment. You know, I think that that's that's true. But then again, there's all kinds of of ways that are legal and totally correct for people to enjoy the series. I mean, going in with some friends to buy a subscription and then having a viewing party or even just reaching out to a local Trek fan group and saying, hey, is, you know, somebody going to do a viewing party and, you know, can I come or, you know, just just going in with a group of friends on a subscription. I mean, I think there's lots of ways to, to lessen that cost. And I, I think I'm reminded of, of Rain Wilson's panel at STLV yeah. the, just just passed where he was taking the task, the people who were sitting in thousand dollar gold seats who said they wouldn't pay six dollars a month for discovery. Right. And he, he thought it was a little incongruous. Uh, to mm-hmm. spend a thousand dollars on a convention ticket, but then say six dollars a month is is too much. So people have to make the decisions that are right for them. But I think if people want to watch it, they'll watch it. You're absolutely right. But long story short, everything is great with Discovery, and we're excited to see what they have for season two. But moving on to some not so great news, uh, I don't think we have addressed this on Weekly Trek yet. But a couple of weeks ago, we found out that. Well, the story has been around, but it's become a little more public since STLV that Nishal Nichols has been uh, diagnosed with dementia. And there is there are updates on this particular situation, but she has been put in a conservatorship. And now there is an update that one of her friends, Angelic Fawcett, who's claiming to be close to Nishal Nichols, uh, has filed an or- an, essentially an order to try to get her out of that conservatorship. How, what are your feelings about the situation? What What do you think? And I just, yeah, I just would like to know your general thoughts, John. Well, I can't speak to the specifics of what's going on here, except to say that that uh, I think all the fans wish the best for Nichelle and, and hope that everything turns out in the best way possible for her and for her legacy and for her family. But as someone who has a quite an elderly parent, this is a, a part of being older. It's uh, something that happens to a, a lot of people. And I think that there's certainly a lot of interest in making sure that her estate is protected and making sure that she's protected. And sometimes it seems that people can't always agree on the best thing. And so it turns into a legal dispute. And uh, all I'll say is that I wish the best for Nichelle and uh, for her family. And I hope that uh, a court system takes its time to adjudicate this correctly. And I hope that everything turns out turns out for the best. For those of you that listen to the Trek Geeks podcast or are aware of it, they also talked about this a little bit on their last episode. And they were mentioning how they went to get an autograph from her. And she at one point just forgot how to spell a particular word. And she had to ask someone. And it was just before STLV that people also found out that she has stopped all her convention appearances and there was speculation that that 2018 was her last STLV. So it's, yeah, it's definitely a very painful situation. And really, I hope Nishan Nichols, after all the hard work she has done and everything that she has accomplished and how far she has come that in, in these days where things aren't the best for her mentally and physically, that she's just, she's protected and, taken care of and does not have to worry about things that she is currently having to deal with. Absolutely. Moving on to another uh, bummer news, but I think I have mixed feelings about it. So I guess I'll get John first on this, but Will Wheaton has deactivated his Twitter after a lengthy statement wherein he criticizes Jack, the owner of Twitter. And and this mainly started after Alex Jones, the well-known provocator and fake news spreader. His uh, platforms were being removed from everywhere, but Twitter kept giving him chances and they finally settled on a two-week suspension, but that's all they're doing. So he still has his Twitter account. And that wo- that seemed to have been the straw that broke the Wheaton's back. And he just decided, I cannot be on Twitter anymore. None of this. He essentially, in his statement, you can go read this on uh, we are reporting this from comicbook.com. You can go read it. I'm sure you can find it. Uh, he talked about how social media has become negative, and this is a particular example of that. And 
he just wants to go away because it's a good time for him to go because he does not think that whatever is going on is right. And I have mixed feelings about everything that he has said, but I would like to get your thoughts on this, John. What did you think? He certainly can make his own decisions on whether or not he wants to be part of Twitter or any other platform. That's that's his choice. I am a follower of his on Twitter, and I can say that he has never shied away from controversy. Uh, and in fact, he's courted controversy, I think, on more than a couple of occasions uh, because he takes very political stances on things. And when you do that, whatever side you're on, you're you're going to get some some stuff coming at you, I think. And I can only imagine how exhausting that would be and how tiring that would be. And I, I would just think that he's probably tired. I was actually listening to a podcast that had a civil rights attorney on it. And she was someone who had been involved in free speech rights for a long time. And it's something that I've often thought about when I read these articles, because one of the things she challenges her audience to do is as a free speech advocate, she would, she said, can you write down a document that could be interpreted by people who are not you on exactly what should be allowed and what should be banned? And, and it, just write it down, you know, don't, don't just use these shorthand terms like, well, hate speech, you know, which sometimes turns into things I don't like or speech I don't like or speech I don't agree with. And that is a very, very hard task to actually sit down and actually create the framework to say this is what's allowed and this is what's not. And if you're Twitter and if you're Jack, I can't imagine how hard it would be to actually sit down and create that guidance because whatever you put down, someone's going to have issues with it. And it's a very, very difficult situation. And, you know, Twitter's a private platform. They can do what they want. They can have who they want on their platform or not. Uh, but I think it has taken certainly a prominent place in uh, discourse in 2018, in the 2018 world. And I think that that should be respected. And I, I think that Will is free to participate if he chooses to or not. And Twitter is free to have who they want on their platform. And uh, I think it's just a very sticky wicket to try to figure out uh, where they want to go from here. I, I don't envy them the task ahead. What do you think? So, I, like I said, I had mixed feelings about the whole thing. And my my first instinct about all this is that Will Wheaton, is, he did not have any, he did not have a small following. Let me just say that he had millions of people following him. And he definitely had some financial ties to his social media. Like he has a YouTube channel that he I'm not entirely sure about the state of ownership, but I know he makes profit off of this channel called Geek and Sundry on which he goes and plays board games. So that is kind of also in in a way uh, him abandoning something that used to be financially healthy for him. So he's actually literally putting his money where his mouth is and I respect him for that. And it's good that he has taken a stance and that he has decided that this is something that he's not going to engage in anymore. Uh, but the problem is, though, the way social media and Twitter specifically set up is people are actually, there is an entire segment of the Twitter population that considers this a victory. They say, oh, we have taken down the liberals. This We saw a lot of this when Guardians of the Galaxy director James Gunn was taken out of his, his next movie because of something he said 10 years ago. And... That was for the social media, uh, the the social media keyboard warriors. They they said, "Oh yeah, we took them down," and I'm and I'm afraid that instead of people looking at this as, "Yeah, Twitter needs to re-examine its policies and maybe not let people like Alex Jones or Alex Jones on," the conversation will become a lot more about, "Oh no, you did not win. He left because he had A, B, C, and then." There is another segment going, no, no, we won. This is a victory. I'm worried the the actual nuance and the core of the message will be lost in the noise of this was a victory for us. No, this wasn't a victory for you. And that's kind of also the nature of social media. So from what I've seen so far, it's just disappointing that this is what it has come to. And if we really do not rethink everything about social media at this point, the the cause is lost while it's it's very it's very heroic and it's definitely commendable what will be done is done i feel like it's a little bit like screaming into the void because the the stance that he has taken is uh, to me at least seems like it's being lost in the noise of no this is a victory no this is bad 
just that I wish people would avoid that and actually talk about why he quit. Yeah, he's at the level of Twitter uh, and the the size of his following where he could just tweet that it's a beautiful day today and, you know, a thousand people would attack him in some mm -hmm. way, shape, form or yeah. manner, right? And it's, uh, I think part of it is when you, when you step into engagement uh, with the wider populace and you engage in things which are controversial, it's, it's going to happen, right? It just, it just goes with it. Um, you know, just like, you know, someone who runs for Congress, right? You're, you're going to get attacked, uh, regardless of whether or not you're a decent human being or not, uh, whether or not you, you're a, you know, you could be a saint, but if you, if you run for political office, you're, you're going to be a, you're going to be a target for people. And I think when you take uh, political opinions, you know, which he's free to do, you know, it, it goes with the territory. And, um, I'm sorry that he's taken this step. I thought he had a positive um, uh, influence on Twitter, and I, and I enjoyed, for the most part, his tweets. I certainly didn't agree with him on most of the things he says, but I, I enjoyed uh, his uh, his his tweet stream, and I enjoyed reading it. And I'm sorry to see it go, but uh, I wish him every success, and I hope that uh, he's able to succeed in moving forward uh, with his YouTube channel and in his other efforts. I think he makes uh, the fandom and the world a little bit better place by the things that he does. Absolutely. We move on from what might be bummer news articles to a little bit of a controversy. This was revealed recently, but before I reveal the actual article, John, did you attend the 2017 Las Vegas uh, TNG 30th anniversary panel? Uh, I did. A statement was made during that time where she, she again prefaced it by saying, I've never talked about this before, but during my negotiations for Nemesis, I was asked to either take the money that Paramount was offering me or I would be replaced by Jerry Ryan and they'd bring in Seven of Nine. And this caused quite rightly a lot of buzz just that night. It was one of the biggest things that was talked about after STLV that year. And it has just bled into the conversation because she followed it with her statement on how women are being viewed and how things are being changed, but how, how difficult it was for her and how women are in general paid less than men. Uh, and again, the, the controversy became that she was going to be possibly replaced with Jerry Dine. Anyway, we, the article that I'm referring to on comicbook.com has Jerry Dine responding to that statement in a way. She talked about, I was considered uh, this I'm paraphrasing, but her statement was, I was considered for a replacement, but I wasn't told that it was Marina Sortes. And she firmly believes that it actually wasn't her role because she found out who it was that she was probably going to replace. And she did not reveal it because she said, I think that's ridiculous that I would replace that person. But it's un she's also goes on to say that it's unfortunate that Marina Sirtis was told that as part of her negotiations and it's disappointing for her and uh, she does not like it one bit, but she was told that she was going to replace someone on Nemesis, but it wasn't Marina Sirtis from what she understands. So just a lot of chaos there, but we finally have a response on this. What do you think, John? I think it's hard to separate a hardball negotiating tactic from what was actually going to happen. And I'm not saying that we know that one way or the other, but I do wonder if it was just a negotiating tactic um, that they were using to play both sides to, to get a better price. Because the one thing I am absolutely sure of is that uh, when it comes to negotiations on things like this, there's no kindness involved. It is literally savagery. And that's why actors have uh, talent agencies that represent them. It's why the studios uh, have negotiators and attorneys that are involved in this stuff. And uh, they try to keep the, the, the quote unquote personalities out of it. And it really just is hardball negotiating tactics and everybody trying to get the best possible price. And it's nothing that is elevating or lovely to see for sure. It's particularly interesting to me that this was so, so painful for her as she reveals she, uh, Marina, told that she actually stopped smoking a while ago, but during these negotiations, things had gotten so tough, she had to go back to smoking. So it clearly is, it has its negativity and it has its darkness, just the whole exercise. But I'm glad at the end of the day that she was in the movie because she made the movie better. And uh, it's just, I'm glad everything worked out for 
her especially and the franchise in general and yeah John Luke Picard's back so woo but you know on the other side of it staying out of nemesis was probably a good move cuz wasn't the best star trek film by a long shot <laughs> yeah i'm sure jerry ryan definitely appreciates I, i'm, I'm trying to look on the bright side here man because this is yeah, like no. you know it's it's a terrible situation when you know we're fans and we just want to love the show and we just want to talk about you know uh, what star trek means to us and you know we have to be aware that it's a business right and there's this horrible stuff that that goes on to actually get the show made right all these contract negotiations and all these things and while you know in the days of the star trek inventions in the 70s and 80s some of this stuff might just have been whispered uh, mouth to ear among fans in the hallway we now live in this era of social media and uh, uh, where everybody has a mass communications platform and so these things which we may not have known about maybe 40 years ago now everybody knows when there's some kind of spat or some sort of uh, hardcore negotiations going on stuff tends to leak out and uh, people find out about it and i can only say that you know it's um terrible tactic for the stuff to come out and it's a terrible tactic to use uh to pit one actor against another but i'm sure that it uh, has a long and glorious history in hollywood and i'm sure that it will continue in spite of everyone's best efforts and that's not uh something i say is desirable I'm really uh, speculating that it's a pragmatic matter. I suspect that it will continue. It's again interesting that we go back to Discovery, but with the Discovery cast, I have actually noticed that even though it's one of the most negatively perceived, most polarizing things in Star Trek, the actual cast itself is very supportive of each other. They they seem to have iron chains for their for their friendship links, and it's it's very very heartwarming for me to see that. they all stand up for each other and they support each other and there is definitely a lot of a uh, really good friendship and camaraderie and a feeling of brotherhood there wouldn't you agree i i do i think they are to a person just a lovely and wonderful group and i've just been uh really touched by how deeply committed they all appear to be to each other and to the show and to all the other people that they're working with you know the the other behind the camera creatives the writers and uh directors and and all of that. So, uh it seems to be a very positive group of people and I think that that's just absolutely lovely. But As, ha- ha- having speaking, said that, I just want to say one other thing. I'm sure that they still have these hardcore salary negotiations behind the scenes. Right. And that's part of the job I think for them. That's just how the business works because this is probably the biggest thing they'll do in their lives for everyone involved in Star Trek. So they want to make sure they're secure and I understand that as someone who works for a living and has a job in an industry that has a lot of negotiations and stuff I get it and uh, anyway speaking of behind the scenes people there is one particularly fascinating panel that I got to see at STLV uh, this was Gersha Phillips and the costume designers in Star Trek Discovery and she bought a lot of images and videos for us to see and enjoy I don't know if you got a chance to see that panel but it was definitely very interesting and she talked about a lot of her influence is that she went back to when she was designing the look of Star Trek where do you have that panel I missed most of the panels I think I was in the main theater for maybe an hour or two maybe 2 hours throughout the whole convention uh and I'm not even joking it I was I missed the majority of panels just cuz of some other stuff that was going on so I did not see that panel and I'm sorry to say I missed it. I I would have really enjoyed that. I I did go see the Discovery prop exhibit which I and costume exhibit which I loved and I thought was just so wonderful, but uh, I missed um the amazing Gersha Phillips. So tell me what you what your takeaways from the panel were so that I can live vicariously through your experience. <laughs> well, uh, she talk, she just mainly talked about at the panel itself how uh, she was inspired by medieval architecture when she was designing the Mirror Universe. and she talked about how the biggest challenge for them was in season 1 coming up with a uniform that seemed new but yet seemed star trek and uh, that was the, the that was where the they, she also talked about the disco shirts and she said that someone this, it was almost apparently by chance that someone said hey wouldn't it be cool if they wore like shirts that said disco and because they are on that ship and it's a good workout thing and they immediately like in the idea and marketing picked it up and ran with it and uh, so it was nice just to listen to all her uh, the tales that she that she reminisced and 
the stories that she told us and the images that she showed us. But good news for you though, John, because if you missed it, there is a Trek Core interview where she goes into some of these things that she talks about, particularly for season two. She talks about, which is my favorite term for the way, she talks about brutalist architecture that was brought to her while she was designing the Mirror Universe costumes. And she talks about how there was an intention to not sexualize them like they did mainly with the original series, but a little less so in our other shows. And uh, her main intent about making it look and feel right, she goes into some of the challenges. And I'm just uh, like, just looking at the amount of research and the amount of work that went into season one and how much work is going into season two from what we've seen so far and a lot of what we haven't seen yet. It's just very, very heartening. Yeah, I I appreciated the fact that they didn't try to over-sexualize the, the actresses in particular, right? Because Mirror Universe uniforms, I think, for m- most of Star Trek has meant belly shirts for the actresses. And I was just glad that they chose to go a different direction. Um, I, I think it's time for that. And uh, I, I didn't want to see that. Um, I, I just I just thought it was the right step to do. And, and I thought the design that she had was great. I thought those uniforms were fantastic. And I think that the, and this is going to, this is a very difficult point to make because the sample size is so small, but I will say that I think it was a hit for the fans based on the number of people I saw cosplaying in those mirror uniform, mirror, mirror universe uniforms, uh, mm-hmm. at STLV. I mean, they were just really, there was really a lot of people that put a lot of effort into creating those things and doing some amazing cosplays. And Trekor actually brought that up and they asked her, how does it feel to look at your own costumes? And she talks a little bit about that. She basically is just incredibly flattered. But one thing I never considered is how much they have to work with set designers. And she goes into that. But as a costume designer, you, I never thought about this, but she's so right. A big part of the job is working with the people who are designing the sets. So when somebody in a costume walks into a set, it complements that set and it makes the image better. And I never thought about that. So she mentioned about how when they were designing the Mirror Universe sets, they went into brutalist architecture, which again, just to reiterate, is going to be the Wikipedia article that will be stuck on all day. And I just, I, 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 do appre- I just appreciate the amount of work that went into this. And uh, those, those uniforms are some of my favorites. And for those of you who are interested, there is actually... An article, we'll probably post this on Weekly Trek at some point, that explains what each of the badges that were worn in Mirror Universe are. But just so much detailing and so much intricacy. It's just all so incredible. Yeah, one of them, uh, if if memory serves, one of them means you're a master of poisoning. And the other one, it, there was one that means you've killed a thousand people and I, or something like that, <laughs> if, if memory serves. I mean, it really was. They, they put some thought into what all those little doodads they were wearing were. But not that it's Mirror Universe related. My favorite uniform detail that I did take from STLV was I was able to catch Jason Isaacs, his panel. And one of the things he talked about was that they wouldn't allow any wrinkles or creases anywhere in the uniforms. And and so uh, he talked about the fact that the uniform jackets, the blue uniform jackets are zippered into the pants and he wasn't allowed to have a scene where he would be standing and then sit because the uniform would wrinkle. So he had one uniform for sitting and one for standing. (laughs) <laughs> and, and and so if he was going to be sitting, he had to put on this uniform to make it look right. And if he was standing, he had to put this other one. And he wanted to raise his arms up all the time. And he couldn't because it caused wrinkles and bulges in the wrong place in his costume. And they were like, put your arms down. You're not allowed to do that. So he had to he had to kind of work around what he wanted to do and, and change his acting style because the uniforms were so constraining. So it's important to realize as people who are just watching the show and thinking, man, these people look so great in those uniforms. Those uniforms are not meant to, to be worn as actual clothes. They're, they're, they are literally, <laughs> they are literally props that just fit around the actors <laughs> and they have to make <laughs> do with them. <laughs> uh, no, that I, I actually did miss the Jason Isaacs panel. So thank you for telling me that. I appreciate you sharing that with me. And we also have the famous Picard and Riker maneuvers, right? From the next generation where they, they 
detail their difficulties with the costume. So that's not new, and I'm glad that Discovery is continuing on with the same fashion. But looks like those are all the big news items we have for this week, John. Uh, thank you again for joining me for Weekly Trek. Uh, before we get out of here, what's going on at Trek Profiles over there? I hear you're doing some really good work. Well, we uh, released three episodes in July, and so for a monthly podcast, having exceeded our goal by 200%, we took a little interregnum uh, for STLV, but everyone who's interested in Trek Profiles, you can know that I have not one, not two, not three, but I have four interviews uh, locked in coming up within the next uh, six or seven days. So that doesn't mean that you're going to get a whole bunch of new episodes all of a sudden, but uh, I'm going to space them out. But uh, we have a lot of new content coming to you and a lot of and the biggest change, I think, is that now that we've sort of established how the podcast works and uh, what I do, we're going to be having new and different kinds of Star Trek fans uh, on the show. So which I think was important to me because I wanted to have a diverse opinion and diverse backgrounds and, and diverse kinds of fans on the show. So I think it's going to be very interesting. So uh, keep your eyes peeled on your podcast catcher uh, to see what sort of stuff we have coming out very soon. And how about uh, you, Shashank? What's what's coming on Polytrex? Thanks for asking. Polytrex, uh, we just dropped our STLV supplemental, which uh, we got quite a lot of uh, interesting tweets and shout outs for because I pitched a crazy Star Trek uh, Picard series idea to our uh, host Barry and our guest Jamie. And uh, I might end up writing a blog article about it on our Tricorder uh, blog because it's just it just seems so valuable to me. But uh, going out of my selfish uh, little bubble, we got to talk a little bit about the politics that happened at STLV. And uh, people seem to respond well to that. So we thought we'd actually expand it and do a full episode on just the politics that happened at STLV and politics in conventions in general and why we go to conventions. Like Barry and I want to deconstruct why people go to what is on the surface, a grand exercise in just self-agreement and a bunch of people who agree with each other. And we hope to, we hope to bring something fun and interesting to everyone's ears, but also to actually get some constructive action out of that episode. And just to tease another episode, I don't know when this will be dropped, but we did an interview with one of the, one of the behind the scenes Star Trek bigwigs. Uh, and I just, all I'll say is that was one of the coolest, most intelligent interviews that I've ever been a part of. I was just happy to sit there and listen. And when it drops, you will see me melt into a puddle of joy because I cannot wait for people to listen to it. But that's everything on the Polytrex front. All right. Outstanding. And you can always follow what's going on with Tricorder Transmissions at Tricorder Show, which is our uh, podcast network Twitter feed, and always at www.thetricordertransmissions.com. And if you enjoy the podcast network, if you enjoy this or any of our shows and you wish to become a sponsor of the network, you may do so through Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash Transmissions. And becoming a sponsor gets you early access to episodes. It also gets you access to unedited episodes of some of our podcasts and also to our uh, Patreon hangouts, which we do at least quarterly, sometimes monthly. But they're always a barrel of laughs and always uh, bizarre and a lot of fun. So uh, watch for that. So we would appreciate you uh, signing up and supporting us uh, on Patreon if you are so inclined. And uh, with that, I think that's going to do it, Shashank. Uh, Anything else in closing? No, you're wonderful, John. I enjoy Trek Profiles, and I believe you can also follow Trek Profiles on at Trek Profiles on Twitter, and you can follow me, uh, or rather my show that I do with Barry, Polytrex on at Polytrex on Twitter. And we we just hope to continue this conversation. Reach out to us, tell us how we did. We're excited for you to listen to everything that we have coming from the the tricorder churn and thank you for joining us this week uh, but Shashank wait a minute we forgot one of the biggest things going on a tricorder show oh my goodness I can't believe I I almost neglected to to mention this we have a new show coming that's right Uh, we have a new show called Queer Trek that was just announced by Heather Barker co-hosted by uh, Marty from Reading Trek it's going to be Star Trek from the LGBTQ perspective and from what I know of the show so far, it's going to be incredible. It's very creative, uh, very new, something that was sorely missing from the Trek community that Tricorder is filling the gap for. Again, just very, very inspiring to see that 
they want to do a, a show from just that perspective. So yeah, I'm excited for that one. Thank you for bringing that up. What, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I know that, uh, well, I think you and I both know that, that Heather and uh, Marty have a lot of energy and interest in this. So I know that they're going to put a lot of energy and passion into creating a, a great show that uh, examines Star Trek from a unique perspective. So I think it's going to be interesting to add to the mix. And uh, I look forward to listening to the first episode. So uh, I'm jazzed. And I think that's going to do it for us uh, for this week for Weekly Trek. So until next time, live long and prosper. And onward to Star Sighting.